episode 108 of the Inside the Mind podcast, and I'm privileged to be joined by Jacqueline Simoneau, who is part of the uh, Canadian synchronized swimming team and a 2016 Rio Olympian. And I don't know if you could have anticipated this or not, but in preparation for this interview, I had watched the perfect documentary by CBC. Um, I know it's a couple of years old. I think it was 20, 2017 or 2018 and got released, but I mean... I was blown away just getting that that kind of inside view of synchronized swimming because being maybe not so familiar with the sport, I had maybe no idea what it was like behind the scenes. But just to know the amount of practice, um, even just like the video like analysis and people in the moment, you're like going back. It was very much, it reminded me of like an NFL or CFL player, just the amount of preparation into it and just the video like analysis in the moment. It just really, really blew my mind all the preparation that goes into it. Wow. Well, that's amazing research starting off. Not a lot of people watch that documentary unless they're, you know, on a plane or whatnot. So kudos right. to you. Yeah. And, and thanks. I mean, for comparing us to NFL players, I mean, not a lot of people recognize the sport as an actual sport, even though it's in the Olympics. Um, and it, it is it does require a lot of physical and, and mental effort. So thanks for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued what it was like for you first entering um, the Canadian synchronized swimming team and kind of being part of that group of, of female athletes um, and just what it was like for you making that transition. Because I could imagine for, for someone in your position, when you first enter that sort of group or that team, you probably never experienced preparation um, or just the, the kind of detailed critique um, I get in your life before? It definitely was quite the transition when I arrived on the senior national team. I was the youngest member at the time. I was 15 years old. Um, and I was swimming with some idols who were actually Olympians who competed wow. at the London Games in 2012. And it was a really eye-opening experience for me. I got to soak it all up and see how these Olympians and how my idols train and, and learn from the best of the best. Um, so it was an adaptation, but uh, more in terms of training hours. Usually before coming to the center, I would train from one in the afternoon to 7.30 at night. And now the training days would start at 6.45 in the morning and go until three or four o'clock. So it really was a whole day affair. And that's where most of the adaptation had to take place. And I mean, even as a, a 15 year old, that just blows my mind because I think about what I did as a 15 year old, just sat on my basement and played Xbox all day. And, and here you are as a 15 year old <laughs> and many 15 year olds out there that, you know, they take that next step to the elite level of their sport uh, and just the amount of sacrifice and dedication that goes into it. When that transition was happening, did you feel ready for it in the moment or was there some hesitancy uh, or self doubt, I guess, in that moment? I think when I was young, I was maybe a little bit naive. Um, I didn't see anything that could really get into my way. I was fortunate enough to still live at home with my parents and have a wonderful support group. So um, I didn't see anything that could go wrong. I only saw a world of possibilities ahead of me. Uh, so I guess things have changed a lot between now and then. I kind of wish sometimes I had that 15-year-old mentality when approaching some things these days. Okay. Was there a moment or earlier on where... It, it kind of really stood out to you or really kind of maybe shook you a bit, just the amount of preparation and dedication that, that goes into being part of the, the senior team? Definitely. Uh, my second year on that team, actually, I was chosen to be uh, also part of the duet and the solo event. And that's when it really hit me hard. I realized how much work and preparation has to go into this. Um, I would train more than some of my teammates because you have extra events. And so it was... Um, it was quite challenging at that point. I, I didn't know if I had it in me sometimes, you know, constantly getting feedback and corrections. And that's when you actually doubt yourself because sometimes it's seldom to none when you get some positive feedback. Um, but when you do get that positive feedback, it definitely is rewarding. So that second year is when it really hit me hard. Right. And I mean, it, it kind of got me thinking just you know, the amount of sacrifice that somebody has to put into their sport, right? And and maybe even that realization that not even just sports, um, just life in general and just following your passion, that it's not always, you know, sunshine and rainbows. Like there are those hard moments. Um, there are those moments where you might start to doubt yourself or those moments where you feel like you're missing out on other things in life or friends and family, whatever it is. But I think that's a really good lesson for people that 
to, I think to trust your gut is a kind of a saying I always like to go to. And in your gut, if you think you're making the right decision and you think this is your passion and your purpose in life, uh, there's inevitably going to be some sacrifice. But at the end of the day, it's all going to be worth it. Definitely. I 100% agree with that. Trust your gut is something that I definitely believe in. Um, and I've definitely kind of looked back on parts of my career. So I definitely can speak to that. Is there one, is there one part of your career in particular where, where that really does ring true, trusting your gut? Yes. Um, after the Rio 2016 Olympics, I um, don't want to say I contemplated retirement, but a lot of people said, okay, great. You've done your Olympics now. What's, what's next? Um, and I had to revisit that. I mean, school is a big priority for me as well. And, and family time and, and volunteering and whatnot. So I had to revisit my core values. And um, at the end of the day, despite my pros and cons list, I really just trusted my gut and said, you know what, I still love this sport. I'm still passionate about what I do. So why not stay in it, go for another Olympic games or another one. Um, and that's a moment where I really had to just trust my gut on that decision. And in 2016, you probably, if I, if I do my math correctly, you're probably are only around like 19, 20 years old, like in that range. Is yep. That, is, that common, is that common for synchronized swimmers to test? First of all, start so early on in their life, 15, 16, and then second to, to contemplate retirement or thinking about the next steps in life that, that early on, or was that, did you find that was really unique for your scenario? I think I was quite fortunate. It was very unique for my scenario. I was one of the youngest Canadian Olympians to go uh, to the Olympics in my sport. Um, and so a lot of people often go in their mid twenties and maybe only have one or two Olympic games in them and then end up retiring. And so it's not common for people in my sport to do more than one Olympics because you end up going in your mid twenties and that's usually your peak. So I was, I was very fortunate to have you know, this whole time frame and this whole timeline ahead of me where I had the luxury of making this decision. Mm -hmm, for sure. And even from, from the doc, another thing that, that opened my mind a lot, and I think it was a quote that, that I listened to you say in it was just the amount of narrow focus on just one goal that it takes to succeed in synchronized swimming. And for someone like myself and for a lot of other people that I just talked to, you know, either on this podcast or just, I know personally, that's something that I think a lot of people struggle with is that narrow focus because they feel that with the narrow focus on one goal, there's so many other goals they may have um, that they can't, they can't pursue. Like even for me personally, I have this podcast that I want to pursue and I try to put all my focus into it. But then I think about, am I, Am I sacrificing my time training like for tennis? Am I sacrificing my time playing guitar? Am I sacrificing my time education wise? I'm intrigued how you yourself was able to kind of fight through if you yeah, went through a similar process like that or how are you able to fight through it? Because I think that's something sport, athletics or not, everybody in their life deals with at one point or another. Yes, uh, that is for sure. Definitely something that um, happens in an athlete's life and um, throughout my career, it's, it's easy to fall back and look at it as sacrifices. Um, and I like to look at it as choices. You know, I choose to spend this time in training and I choose to prioritize swimming right now and, uh, choose to allocate a smaller amount of my time to school and friends and whatnot. And sometimes making these choices are hard. Not all choices in life are easy. And that's why they could often be looked at as sacrifices but at the end of the day, I know I had the choice. I control where I spend my time and my energy. Um, and sometimes you look back and you say, what if, you know, what if I spent more time on X, Y, or Z? And those are moments where you just can't doubt yourself. You have to really just focus on your goals. Like you mentioned, um, Adam, and just, you know, trust your gut again in these moments when you make these choices. I, I love how you, you said there, like it's a choice versus a sacrifice. And I think that that almost kind of empowers the decision and takes away like some of the, that negative stigma, for example, towards like a sacrifice, for example, like when you choose to do it, like this is your choice. And I think it's also the recognition that no choice is necessarily a hundred percent perfect. Like there's always pros and cons to each choice, right? I don't think anybody can make a choice in their life where it's a hundred percent pros and, and zero cons. So I, that was something that really stuck out to me that I think, I mean, I'll definitely try to incorporate that more, but I think a lot of people will find some value in that where when it's your choice, then there's a sense of empowerment behind it. 
Definitely. At the end of the day, you choose what direction your life goes to. So at the end of the day, you just need to be happy with whatever choices you made. Um, and the fun part about this is that you could always change your decisions and your choices um, because you're in the driver's seat. So once you realize that, I think you have the world, the world is your oyster uh, in front of you. It, yeah. It, and it's unfortunate because I see so many people, they're scared to make that switch in their choice, like to change their choice. Because at least in my experience, talking to, to people um, that I know or that I've interviewed, there might be a perception that if they change their direction, it kind of seems like they're quitting or they're giving up on their goal. But my always my, kind of what I always say or my always thought process behind that is like people's like their preferences, what they like, what they want to do, their passions, their goals, all those things can change day to day. Um, and I think, like you said, going back to the choice versus sacrifice, like if this is your choice and you're doing it for the right reasons because it's truly what you believe. Who cares, you know, what other people think if you stop something halfway through and do a completely different direction? Because I think a lot of people would benefit more from that than staying in what they're doing, even if it's not making them happy. Definitely. And I, I completely understand that intuitively and instinctively, we have this feeling that um, you're giving up on something. Um, and I've had that feeling multiple times throughout my athletic career, feeling like as if I'm giving up on my school dreams or spending time with my family, because instinctively, I think that's a, a reaction to have naturally as an athlete, when you're in something, you're in it 110%, you're not in it 60%. And so I think it's normal to have these types of reactions, feeling as if you're you're kind of letting go on something, but at the end of the day, you need to realize that in life, that that is normal. Um, you are able to kind of have different goals and different times to achieve these goals too. And I, I don't know if that makes perfect sense, um, but once I had that kind of realization and that click, um, I was able to put myself a lot more at ease in these decisions and choices that I was making. Yeah, you know, nobody wants to be a hoarder of goals in their life, like taking on too much, right? And just piling up and piling up all these things. And eventually you don't make any progress in anything. And even kind of doing a bit more, you know, just on research on yourself and your athletic career so far, and just kind of keeping in, in my mind, just how young you were as an athlete, but how many athletes and people in, in their lives, um, again, athlete or not business, whatever it is, they start something so young but I think sometimes they they lose sight of how young they are and just how long their life is. Like at, at the part, the particular point in time, someone's 15 or 16, they choose to commit themselves to something for four or five years. It might seem like so long, but at the end of it, you're still 20, 21 years old. You're gonna leave, you're gonna live till you're 80 or 90. Like there's so much time in your life to do whatever you wanna do. Oh, 100%. Um, and I think one thing, at least for most athletes, it didn't hit me until after the Rio Olympic games, but um, we seem to have this kind of normalization of a timeline. You know, you do your undergrad from X age to Y age and you should be done school, um, you know, by the time you're 30. And uh, that was one thing that always scared me, you know, knowing that I'm probably going to be in school when I well into my thirties um, and kind of not following this traditional path. Um, and this is, I think a lot of doubts that a lot of athletes have, but once you realize that it's normal, that you could have, you know, one thing at a time, you, you can't really do everything at once. You can achieve all your goals in one time. Um, it's, it's easier said than done, but it's, it's, um, it's doable. You just need to accept the fact that, you know, going to school or achieving your goals later than your timeline is still fine too. Right. I love that because I mean, it, it I always love kind of the quote is the perfect timeline is your timeline. Like there's obviously that, that, that timeline, that perception out there. Like you said, someone's got to be in school from 18 to 22 at university or college. Then they get a job, they start a family, they get a house, whatever it may be. That's like the quote unquote traditional timeline. Cause that's maybe what, what's pushed in, in TV shows or movies or media or whatever. But of course, everyone's timeline should just be following their passion and goals. And you might reach those passion and goals at different times. But again, as long as you are okay with, with the choices you make and, and you can live with yourself with them, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Um, the, the other thing that, that really struck me from the doc, uh, I don't know if it's actually from the documentary, but I think it was maybe from a, uh, another interview that I saw that you did was that you said that you weren't a naturally born 
synchronized swimmer. <laughs> I know you were talking a bit about kind of like your body type and, and your height and all that stuff and comparing it to like maybe some of the Russians or other countries where they have that very tall figure, long legs and whatnot. And I think a lot of people can sympathize or empathize with that, that they feel like they're not natural in whatever they're doing. They don't feel like a natural born blank, whatever it is. So I'm just intrigued from from your perspective and from your experiences when that feeling started to kind of creep into your head and when it finally started to creep out of your head, if it has uh, completely. I don't think it ever has gotten out of my head. I mean, I just returned from the the World Series in Budapest and Russia was one of the countries that was there. And um, you know what? I, I gave one of my best performances and the Russian coach and manager came up to me and said, you know what? the only thing that's missing is that foot extension, like that, that ballerina arch, that foot. And prior to doing artistic swimming, um, I did hockey and diving. And these are all sports that are powerful and don't really require, you know, a lot of grace, a lot of flexibility. And so I lost that kind of age range where I could work on that ballerina foot arch. Um, so I'm still reminded to this day that I don't have this natural body type and that is what unfortunately is holding me back in this sport that it shouldn't count to be honest. Um, judges judge the difficulty, the execution, the artistic impression, and they follow this one book. It's called a FINA manual. And, um, there's nowhere in this book where it describes having a natural ballerina arch and that flexibility, but it's something that the judges subconsciously want to see as if they were seeing a Russian ballet. So, despite me having this, this height and this uh, powerfulness and even this grace in the water, um, it's something that's still holding me back. And, and for Russia to come out and, and tell me this and say, you know what, like you would be, you're, you're at our level, you're just missing this. Um, you know what, I, I take it as a compliment nowadays versus when I first started in the sport, when I first got into a club level and we had to fill out the form with what our goals were. And I wrote um, that I wanted to go to the Olympic Games because I always knew from a young age that I wanted to go compete at the Games, be surrounded by the best athletes in the entire world. There just was something so magical about it. And back then, I fell in love with a sport of synchronized swimming. Um, I was a multi-sport girl growing up, you know, hockey, soccer, baseball, tennis. I just loved all of it. And I couldn't pick one. And when I found this sport, it kind of encompassed all of these sports that I loved to this day. I still do diving, uh, triathlons on the off season, you know, weightlifting, um, running in the gym, flexibility, trampoline, gymnastics. So it has a lot of sports inside of it. And not only is it a team sport, but you also have the solo event and the duet event. And so I knew that this is a sport I wanted to go all the way in. But when I filled out that form and I wrote that I wanted to go to the Olympic Games, some of the coaches at the club level said, you know what, Jacqueline, um, you might want to go back to diving because you don't have that built. You're too short. You're definitely not flexible. And they really doubted that I'd be able to get all the way that I, that I did today. Um, but you know what? I, I thank them for their honesty um, for sharing that with me. Um, but nowadays, I just kind of look at this whole not built to be this type of athlete as kind of just, you know, fuel. It fuels me during training to work even harder. And how young were you when, when you had filled out that form? Like, I'm assuming you were, you were before you were 15, so you're still quite young. I'm just thinking because as a young kid, that's got to be such a, such a weird position to be in, to be, you know, told these things already that you're not going to make it. You're not going to, you're not the perfect, you're not the right, the right person for the job sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, so I was um, nine years old when I started the sport, and I did um, artistic swimming and synchro back in the day and diving for a few years at the same time. Um, but it was really nine years old when they said, you know what, focus most of your energy on diving. Um, but <laughs> I, I really just love the sport, so I it stuck me right from there. And you know what, I think it was better that it hit me at that age, because when I was, when you're young, you just feel unstoppable, right? You feel like Superman or Superwoman, like you could achieve anything. So I'm, I'm kind of grateful that it happened at that age and not younger, perhaps in my teens where, um, maybe that self-doubt would have hidden. Exactly. No, I, I always, that's why I'm always a huge proponent for kids to be involved in sports, team sports, individual sports, whatever it is, as early on in their life as possible. Because I think there's certain situations or certain moments of adversity 
that you encounter in athletics, whether directly or indirectly, um, that you can't get anywhere else. And the earlier that you, um, that a child, for example, um, goes through adversity, the easier it's for them to push through it later on in life. Whereas if you always hold off in the adversity and you just take the easy path through everything early on in life, when you're older, you don't have the skills developed to be able to properly deal with some adversity that e- even though, you know, at nine or 10 years old, the adversity there seems so, you know, a magnitude so great. When you're 20 or 30 years old, the adversity that you'll face there is so much more um, intense, I guess, than you would as a little kid. Definitely. And I I 100% agree that sport teaches you all these things that you could transfer on into your everyday life, even outside of sport. So I'm grateful for all the lessons that sport has taught me at a young age, Um, you know, teamwork, communication, hard work, and overcoming these obstacles, because you're entirely right, Adam, if, you know, if one were to be you know, coddled at a young age and not facing adversity, what would, what would one do when you, you enter your late teens, your twenties, um, and you're encountering all these obstacles, you wouldn't be equipped to deal with them. Right. I mean, I'm intrigued given your, your extensive background as, as a multi-sport athlete growing up and now primarily focus on synchronized swimming. Is there one, one piece of synchronized swimming one, you know, type of adversity, I guess, or one challenge that's of synchronized swimming that you found that, that you sorry, what found was different than all other sports that you had played. Yeah. I think the fact that the sport is, is quite diverse. Um, and I can't really pinpoint one specific thing, but, uh, like I mentioned, I did diving before this, I did hockey and I love doing the drills and hockey, the on ice and off ice drills, but that was kind of the extent of it, you know, spending time in the gym and on the ice or swimming when you just see that one black line and you have four strokes um, versus one day in a synchronized swimmer's life, you could be spending that in the gym, then speed swimming workouts in the water, um, and then going to a solo event, duet event. So you need to constantly change your mindset for all these different things that you're going into. And that's what I love about it. It's giving me the opportunity to adapt to all these different things that are thrown at me. I, I love that so much. Yeah, that's again, that was the part of the doc that that really stood out to me was just it's not just about swimming. <laughs> There's so much other than swimming. I, probably at the end of the day, swimming is is definitely not what you do like at least 50% of your time because like you said, you have the gym, the gym, the weight training. There's gymnastics involved, the flexibility, the mobility, uh, the study of the video and just the mental prep. It really is like a multidisciplinary sport, much like football is, much like hockey is, much like any other sport is. Um, I just think it's maybe just not well known, like you said kind of at the beginning just not that well known of a, of a sport given that's just primarily an Olympic sport, but that's why I would recommend anyone to check out that, that documentary by CBC sport I think It was called perfect. It was just perfect. Yep, definitely. It was just called perfect. And, um, there's this guy who created the documentary. He followed us the year prior to the Olympic games and the year of the Olympic games. So you see a lot of background footage there of what goes on in the preparation. That's only really the, the cherry on top of this whole Sunday. There's a whole part in this documentary that you don't see, but I think he does a pretty good job at at least showing what an artistic or synchronized swimmer does to prepare for the Olympics and everything that goes into it. It's hard to fit those two years, pre-Olympic year and Olympic year into a 45 minute documentary, but at least you can think think to yourself, wow, these 45 minutes are so intense. I wonder what two years of this would look like. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they have hours and hours of footage. They followed us around the world to Slovakia, to Russia, to Puerto Rico and and to to Rio and um, a lot of traveling that goes into place. Countless hours of training in the gym, video analysis. So um, it's just a glimpse of what the two years leading up to the Olympics look like. But I think they did a pretty good job, at least at condensing it into 45 minutes. For sure. I'm I'm intrigued because obviously going through your social media and the posts you put out and just speaking to you here and, and even following the documentary, it's clear not only yourself, but, but everyone on the senior team has such a strong mental game and just it's important to synchronize swimming. I'm intrigued um, or just curious if you had any like kind of go-to resources that you use yourself to improve your mental game, whether it's like books or podcasts or audio books or apps or, or something along those lines, something that you've found um, that's really helped develop your mental game. Yep. So like I mentioned, when I was little, I'm still very fortunate to have amazing family and friends that support me. So I think that's really been my foundation 
of my mental game in this sport. But on top of that, uh, we do have access to mental performance coaches and psychologists. And um, I don't really see any of them individually, but during these team meetings, I really soak up everything they had to offer for us and how to maximize and optimize not only our training game, but our competition game too. Um, So those are some resources as well. And on top of that, you know, the podcast from here to there and and some quotes, I do like to sometimes look up quotes um, when I give presentations to kids and whatnot. And um, before when I was younger, I didn't really understand these types of quotes when these people would come to our schools and, and give us these presentations. I didn't fully understand the meaning of some quotes um, of what some people spoke to us to, but until you can have a life experience that actually relates to a specific quote, um, it really just sinks into my mind. And those are moments sometimes when I go um, through these life experiences and I overcome some obstacles, I kind of link it with a quote. And when I encounter a rough time, I think back to these quotes and it's just a simple reminder of, you know, staying strong in my mental game and, and getting over it. Uh, that that's that's I think it's a great segue to one of the kind of the last questions I like to ask on this podcast is um, if you if you were given a phone with Instagram on it and a profile that if you posted it you can get a post to everybody in the world would there be a certain quote certain picture certain saying certain video what what, what would be kind of that post that you would put out to the the world and kind of the sense of mentality mental game and and sports psychology. Oof, that, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I want to kind of give everybody the sense that anything is possible. You could achieve anything you set your mind to in life. Um, so I think it would be something around those lines. I mean, within that, there's so many things that kind of go in there to support it. I mean, you need a sound mind and a sound body to be able to, to achieve anything you set your mind to, but I think that would be it. Um, you can achieve anything you set your mind to, because I think I truly believe that if you have the mentality, you could do anything you you wish to do. Right. And I mean, you, I I think you'd be a perfect example of that because so early on in your career being told you didn't have the physical body, the physical features to be successful in your sport, to push through all that, to then make it to the Olympic stage, all, you know, the world events that you guys go to and all the gold medals you've won in those world events. It had to be the mental game that pushed you through. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that on top of a lot of other things, I mean, being surrounded by amazing coaches and teammates who support you along the way. Um, But I think you could be the most talented um, athlete in the entire world. But if you don't have a strong head on your shoulders, it won't take you to the NHL or to the Olympics or to any pro team. Cause you really got to have that a good head on your shoulders to be able to support that body. And the body can be trained, but the mind, sometimes the mind could also be trained, but you, you need to be able to be open um, to a lot of new ideas to be able to, to get yourself to where you want to be. I think that's um, being open to, to different ideas, I think is, is a beautiful place to end this off, Jacqueline. I, I appreciate you taking some time today to uh, to share your experiences with the mental side of the game uh, of synchronized swimming. Um, I know myself, I took a lot of key key points away from this that I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to implement in my day-to-day life. And, and I'm sure someone listening, whether they're in synchronized swimming, they're in sports, or they're just interested in improving their mentality, will have something to take away from this too. So I really do appreciate uh, your time today. Thanks so much for having me on, Adam.